what a wonderful day. Uh, you know, sometimes when it's a little dreary and raining outside, it, it, it's hard for us just to, uh, uh, to just be enlightened with the Spirit. But uh, my hope is that this is an opportunity that we can do that. When we gather here and we have the warmth of those of, uh, who have put their faith and their trust in God, there's just something about that, friends, that uh, is joyful. And I give God thanks for this opportunity this morning. This morning we're continuing in our, our series that we're calling Pioneers, in, in which we're, we're looking at some of the, the trailblazers of the faith. And by examining their lives and actions, our, our hope is that we're going to be strengthened in our faith and create some new ways to engage with Christ and with our neighbors. And today our focus, again, uh, takes us to the Old Testament, to uh, the Hebrew Bible, to Joshua and Caleb. Have you ever been that person that asks, how do you get the better things in life? I think all of us, at, at least at some point in our life, have asked that. How do we get the better things in life? And when we ask that question, we, we do so because we tend to think that we don't have the better things in life. You know, we, we say, how did that person get ahead of us? Or how did that person get the better seats? I remember back to my childhood, we, uh, my uh, family and I, we, uh, we, we loved to go to uh, the New Orleans Saints games. We would get in the, uh, uh, the VW mini bus and we would travel the 90 miles up from Homa to, uh, to New Orleans, to the big city, to the big easy. And um, uh, we would make a, a, a whole day of it. And uh, the thing that I liked about going to those games was just the excitement of seeing, seeing Archie Manning play. I just loved Archie Manning, number eight, running around, and he was the only player to watch, by the way. There weren't very many good players on the team. But he was my favorite. And I remember once we were, we were fairly close to the field. I don't know how Dad got the tickets. Somebody gave him the tickets because... It's the closest that we had ever been. And I just wanted to get up there and I wanted to yell out to Archie Manning. And uh, I was yelling and I was screaming, but there was this big kid right in front of me. And every time I would yell, uh, I'd, I'd see Archie look over and I think that he was looking at me, but I couldn't really see because this guy was so big standing in front of me. <sighs> And then the game started, and I lost that opportunity. And I think, you know, how did that kid get that blessing? How did that kid get the better things? How did he get to see Archie Manning so close, and I didn't? You know, sometimes it feels like we're seated in the back. You know, all we can see are the backs of people's heads or their back, and we want to see more, don't we? we? We want more in life. Well, there's a moment in the life of Israel where God was giving the people of Israel an opportunity to take possession of their land, of the, the land that He had promised to them. And as they were on this journey, they made choices. They were actually choosing their land. And I, I think that although most are unaware of it, most of us choose our land. We choose where we're going to settle ourselves in for home and make home there. All of us are, are choosing the land that God is going to, to build the house that we live in. And you know, whether you're aware of it or not, you, you may not like where you're actually positioned in this life. You may not like where you are. And I think that's part of the background of 
this particular story of Caleb and Joshua. There's one particular verse in Numbers. Numbers, we're going to read from Numbers today. How many of you read through the great book of Numbers? Some of us, if we're going through the Bible, verse by verse, we do. But usually we skip through it. But we're going to look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 30. And in that verse, it talks about a man named Caleb. And God says this to all of the people of Israel that were standing there that day. He says this, Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home. Except him, except for Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Think about that. These people, God has promised them a promised land. They have struggled all of their life. And God says to them, uh, sorry, but only these two are going to inherit it. There have been a lot of times in my life where I've been the exception. Usually in the wrong way, I've been the exception. Have you ever been that person? You know, they, they, they picked everybody else except you. Maybe you haven't, but I have many, many times. They invited everybody to the party except you. And usually when you're the exception, you're, you're the one that's left out, right? But in this scripture, the exception is the one who's called in, right? God says, no one's going to get what I promise. And that makes us kind of nervous when we hear that. Because we've heard time and time again that God keeps his promises, right? God says, no one's going to get what I, what I promised. Now, uh, here's what God's saying. He says, I promised to give you a land that you would enter. And I swore with uplifted hands. That means I really, really swore, by the way, that I would do this. So that you would have a land, so that you could make it your home. But now none of you are going to experience this except for Caleb and Joshua. It's interesting that Caleb would be the one, right? Joshua was going to, to lead all the people, but Caleb, why Caleb? If you know anything about, uh, uh, about the Bible, names are important in the Bible. And here it's no exception. The name Caleb means dog. Any Caleb's here? I know we have some. What are your parents thinking? They named you Caleb. It means dog, right? They looked at you and they thought, yep, that's Caleb, right? <laughs> well, that name's been fairly popular for 2,000 years. Because for whatever reason, they named him Caleb at his birth. The name Caleb doesn't have its value by what it meant at his birth. It doesn't just mean dog. It actually has value in what it meant after Caleb's death. Caleb was a pioneer, friends. He redefined his entire name. He was named dog, but he ended up as being a legend. And God said, no one will enter into the land except Caleb and Joshua. We all know Joshua's going to get in, right? Joshua's been there. Joshua's going to get into the promised land. But Caleb, friends, I want to know if you're ready to become an exception to the rule. Because that's what Caleb was. When God says, accept Caleb, what God is actually doing is he's saying, you know, Caleb is my proof that I always meant to keep my promise. Caleb's the proof that I'm a God who always keeps my word, but the rest of you are not going to experience the reality of that. You ever felt like God just doesn't come through for anybody? You ever felt that way in your life? God just doesn't come through for anybody. God doesn't keep his promises. 
You ever felt like somehow what God has written in the Scriptures just never actually becomes a reality in your life? I know for some of us, we have. We, we felt that way. That God just never seems to come through. We come to think that way because it's easier to take if it doesn't work out for anybody else. Right? Let's be honest. If God never fulfills His promises to anyone, we're all just in the same boat. If God never takes your life and does something extraordinarily well, we're, 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 we're all in the same boat, right? I, I think what really bothers us is when somebody's an exception and they prove that we're not actually the rule. That it's not about us, right? When, when God does something more in somebody else's life, and they're just like you, and you realize that. And you want that, don't you? You want that. It causes something in you to look at a person differently when you feel that they're blessed and you're not. If somebody actually is blessed or somebody has healed and you're still in the midst of your difficulties, you begin to wonder why. Why God, them and not me? And it stings, doesn't it? In our lifetime, we encounter people who are so like us in so many different ways. People who struggle with life. People who are dreamers like us. People who struggle with their life. Who are ambitious people as well, just as we are. And what we sometimes struggle with is when those who are like us in these ways become successful. Successful in, in ways that we judge to be success anyway. And if we know them well, it's so very easy for us to pretend to be happy for them, isn't it? I want to ask how many have done that. When somebody else is successful, oh, that's so good. I'm so happy for you, right? Right? I, I hear laughter, but it's because it's true. We think that way. It tears us apart. The reason it's so hard for us to celebrate is because they become the exception that violates the rule. Because if they're blessed, it means that we're not, right? See, if no one makes it, we can say the system's messed up. The system's corrupt. Things are stacked against anyone ever making it in this world. Whatever making it means to you. I think that a lot of us come to believe that somehow life is just rigged. Right? That life is some big game that we play and that there's no way to win. And when we come to believe or think about life like that, some conclude that God doesn't matter. That God doesn't intervene, that God doesn't step into our life or our situations, that He really doesn't fulfill His promises, that God doesn't really take our lives and create something in us and with us that's extraordinary and unexplainable or even miraculous. But then there's the exception. There's Caleb. That person who actually steps into the fullness of what God promises and they ruin everything for us. Because they become a reminder to us, don't they? Their life could have been our life. It was always there for us and somehow we missed it. The people of Israel... We're on a journey and they're moving toward a land where God was going to build them a home. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? But not many of them actually made it to the home that God wanted for them. 
If you remember the story, the story really begins with with Moses when he's encountered by God and God calls him to to set the people of Israel free from the captivity of Egypt. And he, he takes them out of Egypt, takes them away from captivity and slavery, and then he takes them out into the wilderness. And right away, a lot of them said, we don't like this. We don't like the pressure of freedom. We don't like how this feels, and so we want to go back. And they would rather make their home in a place where they live as slaves than to feel the pressure and the anxiety of freedom. And I wonder how many of us here, even though God has a land and a home for us, that we actually chose our land as the place where we would remain in bondage to the things that He came to set us free from. How many of us want to return back to bondage because we don't like the anxiety and the choices that come along with freedom? I think a lot of us today talk about wanting to be free, but I think there are way too many of us who who don't like the weight of freedom. We don't like the responsibility of the choices that we make. We we don't like the stress and the anxiety that that creates in us. Because freedom demands that we grow up. Some would would rather remain in bondage to their old self than accept the new that God puts before them. I know that there are some here today that have come to believe that God hasn't come through for you. But the reason you're not experiencing what God has for you is that you went back. You decided that surrender was your destiny and you're living there. There are others who, who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years when it really should have just taken them a few minutes or a few days and they wandered in the desert through their entire life. In fact, part of the reason that God let them wander is that they didn't have the faith to move forward. So he let them come to the end of themselves in the midst of that journey. And I think, friends, a lot of us are, are, are wandering. See, I, I think there's a lot of us that, that although we, we don't go back to slavery, we, we just basically choose to, to build our house in the land where we just settle and we never really find a home there it's just a settlement we're not slaves anymore but we're really not free either we just settled for less we settled for mediocrity we settled for the status quo and i think there are a lot of us that just keep wandering and we actually think that we're building a home But here's the the reality, friends. As long as you're a wanderer, you can't build a home. One of the ways you can see that is if you're always just running around. If, If you're running from one thing to the next to the next. How many of us here have faced crises in our life and and gotten some help? whether from a friend or or somewhere else, and we didn't like what they had to say to us. So we moved on and we went back to the same problem. That happened to me. It was an awful experience. My first semester in college was horrible. It's the worst uh, time in my entire life. And I had gone and I had just given up, really. And the the friends, the, the, the people in the house where I was living tried to get me help. They made appointments for me to go to go visit with someone. And I made the appointment. They took me there. And I, I went and I talked to the guy. And he asked if I really wanted to change. And I said no. And he said, I can't help you. And I went back to doing the same stuff that I had done before. 
you ever had the advice right in front of you and the help right in front of you and you went back to the same problem. You talk to other people that tell you the same thing. And then you move on. There's, there's some of you that have tried to build your house in the wilderness. And it's just a settlement because you keep cycling back to the same issues over and over and over again. And then there's another group that actually stepped into the promised land that God had promised to them. And they went to war and they took the land and God was going to give them a physical place. And they deserved it in the sense that they stayed with it. They stuck together. They journeyed together. And it's interesting to me that there was nothing negative about Joshua, uh, about his offer to Caleb. See, in Joshua chapter 14, I'll pick up in verse 6. It says this, Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua, Gilgal, and Caleb, son of General Jephunneh, uh, the, uh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God of Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. See, the reason that Caleb's having this conversation with Joshua is that Joshua's trying to divide up the land. He's trying to divide up the land and he's trying to give Caleb, I think he's trying to give him a break. He's trying to give him a piece of land where there's already peace. He's trying to give him what he, he senses that Caleb deserves, peace. You ever had a good friend and when something good happens to you, you want it to happen for them? I think that's how... Joshua felt here. Things were going well, and he wanted Caleb to have it well as well, right? It's good to have people like that in your life. It's just more enjoyable to, to do life with them and to share life with them. And Joshua and Caleb had that kind of a relationship. And now he's looking back 45 years before all uh, uh, of this took place. And he's looking back to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Moses had sent out one leader at that location from each tribe to go and spy out the land that would become the promised land. I know some of you are familiar with this story. Joshua and Caleb were two of the twelve, and when they all came back, ten of them gave a very accurate description of reality. They said the land is full of milk and honey, just like God said. They didn't mention that there are also giants there, right? That's a detail that God sort of left out. Land's flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants there. They said, you know, God told us all about the milk and honey. He never told us about the giants. And I'll tell you, there are giants in the land, and we look like grasshoppers in comparison to them. 
So we shouldn't go. We shouldn't go into that land. And then Joshua and Caleb brought their perspective. God was right. This land is rich with milk and honey. And the other ten are right as well. It's full of giants. Yeah, that's a little detail God left out. But we should go and we should take it. See, they said the exact same thing, right? They simply had different perspectives. Friends, you should never really follow the people who only see the milk and honey. Because if you follow people who only see the milk and honey, they're, they're going to get stopped by giants. And you're going to get caught up in that. And you should never follow people who see milk and honey, but only focus on the giants. Because when they're afraid of the giants, they'll keep you from the blessings of of God as well that's supposed to be yours what we need is to find those people who will see what we need the person who sees the milk and honey and sees the giants and reflects on it just for a moment why do you think God only mentioned the good things and God didn't mention the giants and Joshua and Caleb would say Maybe it's because God didn't think the the giants were important. Maybe the giants are just incidental. After all, what's the joy of getting the good things in life if there aren't some giants to bring down in the middle of it? I think Caleb would be all over that. He's pumped up at 85 about going and defeating the giants. So Caleb and Joshua, they tried to convince them by saying, absolutely right, you're right. There are giants. We look like grasshoppers of them. So what? And so they all refused to go into the land and they wandered for 45 years. So all of these years later, all of these years later, Caleb points Joshua back to that day. Because you see, in some odd way, I I think Joshua was inviting him to take the land that had already been won and basically saying to him that you deserve this. You deserve this land of peace. Have you ever been at that place in your spiritual journey where you've said to yourself, I've had enough challenges? I've had enough struggles. I've had enough faith. I I deserve for God to give me my land, build my house, let me have whatever I deserve to have. And here's an odd thing. I, I can't fully understand this, but it seems that if you want to live in the comfort of your faith, God will allow you to do that can't fully wrap my brain around that if you travel through this country you can find an expression of christianity that actually thinks the measure of your faith is how safe and comfortable your life is there's a whole expression of christianity that thinks that living in the suburbs having a nice car having your 2.3 children and your dog and having the same job every day of your life knowing the paychecks are coming that that's faith Somehow it seems like God just allows us to settle if that's what we want. It's almost if if God says, okay, I've taught you principles for how to live your life well. If you take the principles in the scriptures, if you live a life of generosity, if you live a life of integrity, and you treat people with respect and with value, if you serve others rather than expecting them to serve you, then your life is going to elevate, friends. But the great danger in that is that you think that's actually the land, that it's the place, that it's the space that you're supposed to take. And what you end up doing is settling. You settle there. And I think that's what Joshua wanted Caleb to do. He wanted Caleb to take the easy way out. To take this land that's already conquered, that's at peace. Caleb, go, you've you've earned it, you've deserved it. 
you're late in your life, just go and enjoy the remainder of your life. I think some of us like that idea. But for Caleb, that was the easy way out. If Caleb would have done that, I believe he would have settled for less. Friends, we're not called to settle for less. We're not called to be comfortable. We're called to face the challenges that are before us. And so Joshua said, you know, this is the land, this is the place, let's divide it up. And clearly he was not even thinking about the hill country that Caleb pointed out. Friends, Jesus didn't die so that we could settle. He died so that we would be a part of the the greatest revolution humanity has ever known that would turn the world upside down. And so Caleb says, I'm going to go back to this because I really like it. This part, he says, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the wilderness, he says, so here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out to spy out the land. I love this. 85 years old. And he's ready to go and take the land that he saw 45 years earlier. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now that gives me some encouragement. Many I know look at their life today and as they approach 55 even, they they look toward retirement. And when they retire, they look at their life and say, this is all I want. I just want to enjoy life now. What really strikes me about this is that what they've lived their life for is so that one day they won't have to go into battle. You struggle your whole life to accomplish things, to overcome obstacles. And the hope is that when you retire, you won't have to go into battle. See, Caleb says to Joshua, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised. I've been waiting 45 years for this battle. You yourself heard then that the Anakites, that's the race of giants, by the way. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just like he said. And then I think we should pay attention to what happens next. Because then Joshua blessed Caleb. Now, the way that he blessed Caleb isn't the same as we talk about being blessed in our culture today. In our culture, we tend to to say somebody's blessed when they're rich or they're blessed when they're famous or blessed when they're successful, right? They're blessed when everything's going great. They're blessed when they're comfortable and secure and safe. That's what we call a blessing today. But Joshua blessed Caleb by giving him the battle that he was the only one with the courage to take on. Has it ever occurred to you that God's blessing your life is to send you into the battle against giants, friends? And he gave them Hebron as his inheritance. Friends, that's the kind of inheritance that I want. I want that struggle to know that God is with me. I don't want to settle for less. I don't want to settle from having difficulties in my life because I know that it's impossible. There will always be troubles. There will always be difficulties. There will always be giants to slew. But God has promised us a place. God has promised us a home. Joshua blessed Caleb by letting him take on the most difficult battle yet won. 
The scripture concludes this way. It says, so Hebron, it says, belonged to Caleb ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Friends, are you following the God of Israel wholeheartedly? He followed the Lord with all of his heart, and so it took him into a greater battle. When you place your faith and your trust in God, friends, it might take you into a greater battle. If you want to avoid the challenges in your life, don't follow Jesus. Because there's really nothing easy in that. There's nothing Jesus will ever call you to that will be less than what you're facing right now. There's nothing Jesus will take you into that you will actually have a power to overcome by yourself. He's going to throw you in the midst of all sorts of things. But friends, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you. He's going to keep his promise to you, never to forsake you nor to leave you. Friends, following Christ is not easy. Following the God that sent his only son into this world for our behalf isn't easy. And some of us want to settle for less. Some of us want to give up the struggle and the battle and just relax, kick up our feet. And enjoy life. But friends, in doing that, we settle for less. Pioneers have vision and dreams. Pioneers follow God wholeheartedly. Pioneers go towards the battle. They face the giants. To get the land that was promised to them. And they don't settle for less. My hope for you is that you won't settle for less. That you'll put your faith and your trust in God. Follow his son Jesus and face the giants in your life. Friends, God is not done with you. At 85 years old, God used Caleb. And the one that was born and named after a dog, we remember as the one who even in his older years faced the giants. Let's pray today. God, we give you thanks, Lord, for the encouragement that you give us in those like Caleb. Lord God, give us strength to follow our hearts as we follow you. Help us, Lord, not to settle for less. Stir us up, Lord. Take us out of our comfort zones, Lord, that we might reach out in love and care to those who are in danger and in trouble. Help us, Lord, be the ones who can lead by example and seek justice and peace and mercy. For we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.